All right. So, um, what's today's topic? Privacy. Privacy. Yeah. So privacy. Um, we've all heard of it. We've all talked about it at some point in our life. We've all wanted it from our parents or our friends or our roommates or whoever. But what does privacy mean or what is privacy? Another way of putting this is what makes privacy different from other things? So what is privacy? If you were, if somebody like an alien were to come down and they were to be like, yes, but what is privacy? What would you tell them? It's one of these terms we all understand, but it's actually pretty tough to define. So how would you define privacy? Or give me an example of some place where you have privacy versus some place that you didn't. Having an area or thing to yourself. So to yourself. Area, thing, to yourself. So yeah, that's it. Rodney gives a very nice definition. It's an area or thing to yourself. What does it mean to have it to yourself? What sorts of things, if it's private, do you have? Can, what does it mean for it to be to yourself? What can you do that others cannot? if it's yours or to yourself? Not to the public. Can you say that again? Um, like confidential, not yeah. to the public. Confidentiality, and what do we mean by confidentiality? It basically, with confidential, it basically means it's information that's only accessible to you. So, um, Confidential information is conf is information that is about you or about something that's tied to you and no one else can access it. So that's the key with privacy is also no one accesses you without your permission. So you can let people access you, but it's only on your terms or on, um, on your terms or with your permission. So that's our definition of, of privacy in general. But what we're gonna do here at the start of class is talk about different types of privacy because it's important to keep in mind that even though we have this common sense idea of what privacy is, it actually needs to be understood in a lot of different uh, ways or we use the term in a lot of different ways. And really when we take a closer look, what we find is different types of privacy um, are, we care about them to different degrees and we need to control them in different ways. So because of this, once we carry over to talking about uh, cyber technology and the effects of cyber technology on privacy, until you really know what the different types of privacy are and how they all relate, it's harder to really wrap your head around why you should care about internet privacy, why you should care about digital privacy, et cetera. So the first thing I wanna talk about is, <sighs> this two ways in which a person can have privacy. All right, so imagine the following case. You're sitting alone in your house. Um, Either you live alone or all your roommates and or family are out. It's just you, the doors are locked. Uh, the window shades are closed. Do you have privacy? Yes. Yes, you do. Alone at home versus, now imagine a case. You decide you need to get out of the city for the weekend. So you go on a hike upstate in a state park. You're walking along alone in this state park by yourself, no one's around, you haven't seen another person in a half an hour, occasionally you see a squirrel, but it doesn't seem very interested in you. Do you have privacy? Uh, yes and no. So he, that's exactly the, the point I wanted to get across. On one hand, yes, you do. Um, walking in woods. So in both cases, you have privacy, but there's also a difference between the sense of privacy that you have in these two cases. So who wants to explain what the difference is in the two cases, walking in the public or walking in the state park versus being alone at home? What's the, the key difference here? You don't own the woods. 
but you don't own the woods. So because of this, what can happen? What would it be like if you lose your privacy in this case? Uh, it does. I, I don't know how to explain it, but like if you lose, you could lose it pretty easily because like somebody just walks by. Yeah. yeah, anyone could appear. Anyone just walks by. And when they're walking by, are they doing anything wrong? Okay. Like, no. If another hiker comes along, they're not doing anything wrong. This type of privacy you have where you just happen to be alone in public land or something like that is called natural privacy. This is the type of privacy that you just so happen to have because there, there's no one else around. But there's no sense in which you have a right to that privacy. If a thousand people wanted to go hiking the same day you did on that public land, you don't have that sort of privacy in the sense of you're like guaranteed to be alone. Contrast that with the case in which you're home alone, doors locked, shades down. In that case, what's different? What can you expect? Is anyone going to come walking along? No. no. Or at the very least, the only person who might is somebody who shares that space with you. If you're walking along, you know, you, you come around a bend and you're in the woods and you see someone, you're like, oh, I wanted to be alone, but that person's there. That's fine. I'll just ignore them. If you, you know, open the bathroom door and there's just like your neighbor sitting in there just like, hey, how's it going? And you're like, where the hell did you come from? That is a fundamentally different breaking of privacy or loss of privacy. So this type of privacy is what we call normative privacy. And normative here means it's not just privacy that you happen to have, it's privacy that is your right to have. And we generally think about um, normative privacy as any sort of thing where you sh by right or by law or by something have the ability to dictate who comes into that space and who does not. So places that you have normative privacy are your house, um, inside your car, if you have a car, um, anything you own. That's what we mean by normative privacy. And a key difference here is that normative privacy, let me write it down here, Normative privacy or natural privacy can be lost, but normative privacy can be violated. So when you lose your normative privacy, the person who's taken that privacy away from you hasn't just happened to take it away. Rather, they have done something wrong or they have done something that they shouldn't have. And the clearest way is if you're walking on a, in a national park and somebody um, comes upon you and uh, you don't like them being there, what can you do about it? Nothing. Yeah, there's nothing you can do. And if you try to do something about it, you end up looking like a complete idiot like the Central Park Karen case from, I guess that was in the spring, where the woman accosted the African-American bird watcher and was recorded on camera and ended up looking like a total idiot. Um, if, however, somebody's in your house that you didn't invite there, what can you do about it? You can evict them if they're not supposed to be there. Or... Yeah, if they're not supposed to be there. If you own the place and they're just living there, you can evict them. Or you can, as Rodney says, call the cops. You can be like, there's a stranger sitting on my couch. I'm going to call the cops. And this type of privacy, this normative privacy, is really the one that we're most interested in. It's the one that we feel like we deserve a certain level of privacy. Now, if that's what we mean, this is the one we're really gonna be talking about. And just to, um, just to kind of preview where we're going, one of the major arguments that happens in cyberspace is people, arguing about whether a certain type of privacy should be thought of as normative. So very often we look at a type of privacy and think, oh, no, no, this is privacy I deserve or I earn. And then other people will say, no, 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 that's privacy you just so happen to have sometimes. And the fact that you don't have it on the internet is not a problem. But first off, let's zoom out. Um, why care about privacy? 
why not just be like, yeah, it's fine. I, I, I leave my door unlocked all the time. I don't care who comes in. Um, I don't care who reads my medical records. I don't care who knows everything about me. I actually have a webcam set up in my house so that you can watch me. Uh, you just go to watchyourweirdprofessor.com and you can you know, watch my daily routine. Why does nobody do that? Why don't we want that style of life? Why do we want privacy? What are the key things that we value about it? Give me a second, let me open the window. So one is not being judged. I like to call this controlling the narrative. We're all, we're all the main character in our own life story. We all want to, we're all the hero in our own story. Like, you know, you're never, if you're in your own body, you're not like the, the supporting actor or actress. You are the, the main thing. Therefore, you want to control what gets out about you and who has what information. We don't want everyone to know everything about us because let's be honest, uh, we've all done things we're embarrassed about. We've all done things we regret. We've all said things we wish we could take back. And we don't want everybody to know those sorts of things. So that's the first element with privacy is we like to control the narrative of our lives and we don't like to be judged and too much information. Um, yeah, it, it's just like so much about you. Like, I don't want you all to know everything about me. And I know you sure as hell don't want me to know everything about you. Um, what's another reason we care about privacy? I'll give you a clue. It ties in with what we talked about last week. If I know things about you, what can I do that I couldn't do if I didn't know about you? For instance, if I know what you look like, what can I do now that I couldn't have done before? Well, we were saying last week that they can sell information and I don't know, maybe it's still money from our cars or... Yeah, so more, basically the more information I have about you, the more I can do things. So for instance, in this case, I could like, you know, if I have enough information about you, I can steal your identity. Um, I can pretend to be you. But in a simpler case, just like imagine that, um, imagine you have somebody you really, really hate and you want to punch them in the face. What's step one in punching them in the face? What do you have to do to punch someone in the face no, before no. anything else? Marcus, know what they look like. You have to know what they look like as step one. Um, and then as Cynthia says, you have to be around them and get close to them. You can't punch someone in the face from 35 miles away. Like nobody's arm is that big. You have to get to them. And to get to them, you have to know where they are. So the more privacy you have, the harder it is to know where you are. And the harder it is to know where you are, the less safe you are. Uh, the, the less dangerous or the more safe you are, the more security you have. So another reason we care about privacy is just the more privacy you have, the more security and control you have. Um, control the narrative. The more control and safety you have in your life. Um, so for instance, whenever a war is going on, Who's the first person who gets sent in? Do they send in the troops immediately? No, they send in spies, they send in reconnaissance. You have to know where you're going before you can do anything. In the same way, if you can prevent people from knowing anything about you, you are much safer both physically and also you're safer from manipulation. So for instance, um, if, if you know the sort of thing that a person likes, um, then you're more likely to be able to buy them a present that will make them stop being mad at you. Um, you know, if I know you hate flowers, then if you're mad at me, I'm not gonna buy you flowers to make you feel better. If I know you hate cats, I'm not gonna buy you a pet cat. All of that, if you keep all that information private from me, then I'm not going to be able to hurt you in any sort of way. And I'm not gonna be able to manipulate you. If I if I want to uh, put you in a good mood and I know you like puppies, I might send you a bunch of puppy pictures before I you know, try to have a conversation with you. 
Um, so that's really the key with privacy is we talk about privacy and very often people focus on this one. The idea is that, well, if I don't care what people know about me, I don't have any need to have privacy. I don't have any reason to care. Um, and very often people, when you're like, you know, you're posting everything on social media so everyone knows everything about you. The response is usually something like, well, I don't really care about that. This, this is my life. I don't care what anybody knows. This, however, is very closely tied into it. Um, if you put too much information about yourself out there, you are putting yourself at risk, not necessarily of physical risk, but in terms of um, control over your own life and the decisions you make and what other people can do to manipulate you and lead you to make decisions that might be in their best interest as opposed to your own best interest. So does everyone understand that general idea here? Yes, Professor. Awesome. All right. So the last thing I want to do about privacy in general is now that we've seen like the general reasons we care about it, there's three different types of privacy and they are, can all be understood slightly differently. And you can have them to differing degrees at the same time. And the reason it's important to tie, to um, separate these types of privacy is that very often people don't realize that they're giving up one type of privacy as opposed to another. So very often people will care about one type of privacy, not care about another, and not realize the one that they care about is being violated or affected. So these are the three types of privacy I wanna talk about. And that very vague statement I just made will make more sense when uh, we talk about these in a little more depth. So accessibility privacy, decisional privacy and informational privacy. Um, what does each of these mean? Or what do each of these mean? Uh, let's try the first one, accessibility. What is accessibility privacy? I'll give you a clue. There's a word in here that's the key to understanding it. If you have accessibility privacy, what does that mean? That you can have access to it? Yeah, so accessibility privacy is nobody has access to you or you have control over who has access to you. So for instance, a door is a great invention in accessibility privacy. What does a door do, a door with a lock? You control who has access to you. So that's what accessibility privacy is, is um, no one can reach you. So if like you have no cell phone service, you've got high accessibility privacy. If you're, if you go upstate for the weekend and leave your phone behind, you have high accessibility privacy. If you just refuse to answer your phone and nobody else lives with you, you have high accessibility privacy. If your mother wants to come into your room and you locked the door, you increase your accessibility privacy. All right, decisional privacy. What do you think decisional privacy is? Again, try to dissect the word. What's the key word in this one? That you can choose who can have um, the information. So yeah, so this one is not quite choosing who has the information. It's rather you having control over your own decisions. So you decide what you get to decide as opposed to you decide what you get to do. So for instance, um, a classic case of a difference in decisional privacy. Uh, so decisional privacy is control over own decisions. So um, a classic case of decisional privacy, having a lot of it, is um, choosing own marriage. If you choose your own partner, you have a lot of decisional privacy. Now, what would be a case in which you have less decisional privacy than choosing your own marriage? What type of marriage would be one with less decisional privacy? Yeah, an arranged marriage. Now, choosing your own marriage is high. Arranged marriage is low. So if you 
If your parents decide who you're going to marry, you have less decisional privacy. Why? That decision is something you have less control over. It is less yours. It is rather made for you by someone else. Another case would be a society in which you get to choose your own job, high decisional privacy. A society in which your job is assigned to you by the government or you just become whatever your parents were, less decisional privacy. So this is what we mean by, by privacy. Another one is you, if you get to choose your own college or choose your own school, high decisional privacy. Um, if you're somebody who just gets assigned to college, either because your parents send you there or you're in a country in which you just take a test and they tell you where to go, low decisional privacy. Now, informational privacy. This is actually the one that Ibrahima just uh, mentioned here at the end. As informational privacy is uh, your information, facts about you are private. So it's not your person, it's not your decision, it's rather information about you. You decide who knows what about you. So the key here with decisional privacy versus this is this is deciding your own decisions. This is deciding the information about you. So um, these, so it's uh, control over info about you. So um, things in which you, um, if you keep all your medical records private, if, like if a doctor's office keeps them private, that's giving you informational privacy. Oh, thank you. Give me one second. All right, we're back. Um, are we blurry? Are we unblurry yet? Are we still blurry? Still blurry. I'm still blurry. Okay, give me one sec. Let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, how do I? It's the problem when you have like seventeen screens set up. All right, are we good? Yes. Okay. Now though, I have to push my screen back, but I can't move, so I have to do it with my foot. All right, there we go. Um, so informational privacy is controlling who has access to what information about you. Um. This is the type of privacy we very often think of. So when somebody's spreading rumors about you or telling gossip, your informational privacy has gone down. When you tell someone a secret and they tell somebody else, that's a reduction in your informational privacy. So what you can see, why do we split these up? Because as you can see, while there are intertwined like connections between all three, they're actually separate. So you can imagine a case in which somebody has high amounts of informational uh, or low amounts of informational privacy, but high amounts of accessibility privacy. So what would be a case in which somebody, like there's a lot of information about someone, but it's very hard to access them? Can you think of anybody in the world who fits that criteria? The government? Yeah, government is generally thought of. So like Joe Biden, you can learn a lot about Joe Biden going on the internet. But if you want to meet and talk to Joe, he's very hard to get to. There's a lot of secret service. There's a lot of people you have to talk to. On the flip side, you can imagine somebody who nobody knows anyone about or no one knows anyone about, but they're very accessible. So you know how in like, um, I feel like in cowboy movies, there's often like the new, the new cowboy rides into town for the first time and everyone sees them and like can interact with them, but they know nothing about this person. They're a mystery. So any mysterious person is somebody with high informational privacy, but low accessibility privacy. You can talk to them. Um, you can interact. You could even, if you wanted to hurt them, you could try because they're right there, but you know nothing about them. Um, decisional privacy. You can imagine a case in which somebody, despite uh, everyone knowing everything about them and despite uh, everyone being able to access them, they still have complete control over their own decision making. So someone who's like a, an absolute dictator, you can imagine if they're like a friendly absolute dictator who people can come and visit and talk to, everyone might know everything about them and might be able to come and ask them questions, but this person as the head of state still is in complete control over what they get to do. Um, if I told you everything about myself, so with respect to this class, I have, I mean, I tell you a decent amount about myself. So it's like middle of the road informational privacy. I try to be as 
accessible as possible, so low accessibility privacy, but I still have decisional privacy. If I want to change the syllabus, at the end of the day, I have the power to do that. So is everyone on board with all of these different types of privacy and how you can have behind one, low in the other, et cetera, et cetera? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, awesome. The last thing though that I do want to bring up is that there are connections between them. And very, most importantly, there's a close connection here which often doesn't get talked about. And that is the nature, and this is one we're gonna stress all class. While it's technically true that decisional privacy and informational privacy are separate, generally the more, or the, yeah, the more your informational privacy decreases, the less informational privacy you have, generally the less decisional privacy you have as well. And this matters because even if you're okay with everyone knowing everything about you, most of us are very uncomfortable with the idea that we're being manipulated or that our decisions are being controlled by things other than ourselves. And very often, th what we find is the more information you have about a person, the more you can convince them that they're making a decision themselves when really what they're doing is exactly what you want them to do. And that's really the key of, of privacy, and especially in the digital age. Because what we found is that as this goes down, this goes down. And this one is the one that should concern us. When we have less control of our own decisions, we end up doing things that are against our best interests and rather in the interests of others. And as this one goes down, along the way, we start losing control over our own lives and that should scare us all. All right, so that's the big picture background. Let me now, uh, erase all of this and ask the obvious question, which is why on earth are we talking about privacy in a cyber ethics class? Why did I just spend so long talking about its importance and talking about everything else? What is it about cyber technology that makes privacy such an important topic? So I'm just going to put down whatever anyone writes down or says I'm going to put up here. Uh, professor, um, privacy um, helps keep systems secure. Privacy is crucial for security. Tied in with this is hacking, any sort of identity theft. So it's all of these are. Um, things that are made possible because of computers and are directly tied in with privacy. So these are cases in which, um, like if somebody gains unwanted access to your computer system, one of the things that is threatened is your privacy. But on the flip side, the less privacy you have, the easier it is for someone to get into your computer. Um, and another thing is, Anery just says, another big issue is just technology, tech, in general affects our privacy. And this is really the key one that we're gonna be focusing on this week, which is just the way in which changes in technology have greatly affected the amount of privacy we have. And I don't mean changes in technology like somebody can hack into your computer and like use the systems illegally or commit crimes or do nasty things. I'm rather talking about fundamentally the way in which technology, even when used entirely in accordance with the law, is reducing our amounts of control over our own lives and our own privacy in incredibly complex and sophisticated ways. And basically what it means is we have less privacy than we've ever had ever in our history as a species. And because of this, um, it greatly impacts how we get around in the world, how much control we have, and what our everyday life looks like. So even cases in which you're using, nobody's hacking, nobody's broken into your computer, nobody's stolen your identity, your levels of privacy are much lower than ever before. Now, because of this, what, so it's basically just as technology has changed, privacy has gone down, mostly because developments in technology have changed it. So what are some of the technologies that have changed the nature of privacy? 
What are some things that exist now that didn't exist 10, 20, 100 years ago and have reduced our privacy? Smart um, phones. So, sir, um, even the social media platforms. Social media. What else is there? Cameras. Easily accessible. GPS. Yeah, so just GPS, which is related, and smartphones ties all of these. Um, any, yeah, GPS location services, search engines. And what is what are the little things that are being collected in the background when you use a search engine or go to a website? Your grandmother also makes them. Okay. Yeah, good. So what I just want to do now, this class is going to be pretty open-ended and just talk about the effects that a lot of these things have on privacy and a lot of the ways that they have changed the degrees of privacy we have. So um, which one do you want to start with? Let's talk about social media because this is one in which like it seems like you still have high decisional privacy and low informational privacy. So social media. When you post on social media, what are you doing? And how is that reducing your privacy? Uh, a lot of times, like we were talking about your home, you're actually giving away where you live, you know? Yeah. So one thing with um, social media is when you post something to Instagram, you are giving permission to anybody who has that app and follows you to see what you're doing. And you are choosing voluntarily to give the, them, the person looking at it, access to that information. They now have that uh, access to your life. But more importantly, as Cynthia says, where does that picture go? Who owns that picture now? When you post a photo to Instagram, who owns that photo? Instagram. Instagram. Yeah, Instagram owns it. If they want to use your photo for marketing purposes, they can. If they want to, um, if you, uh, if they want to sell that in for, if they want to sell that photo to someone else by using it, you have agreed that it is theirs. Even something like Blackboard. When I post something on Blackboard, it is technically now owned by Blackboard. If they wanted to take my lectures because they're so amazing and start selling them, they could. So this is a degree of privacy of it's not like now the company knows and can gain access to anything you post and anyone who follows you knows that. So you're just choosing to reduce info privacy. And so at first you might think like, oh, um, I'm just reducing my information privacy. But another thing that's happening here is your decisional privacy is going down. Because as soon as you post that photo, you no longer have complete control over who does what with it. If I have a, like, a photo of myself making a stupid face and I have that photo in my, um, if I have it like saved at my house, then I am able to keep that from, ever being used by anyone else because it's in my control. As soon as I post it to Facebook, Facebook now can take that and do with it what they want. So this is a major way in which social media has just changed the nature of privacy. Um, what about cameras? You know, does anyone, has anyone done those like old timey photos at like the, the um, amusement parks where you dress up like a cowboy or as a somebody and sit there and like, put on a silly costume and someone takes your picture. Have, have people done that or at least know what I'm talking about? I've never actually done it. I just feel like I see it in movies or people post them sometimes. Yeah, no, no, not a photo booth. Like the ones in which you literally, um, the, it, it's like somebody set up with like a, a big fake background. It's like a, a photo booth, uh, like on steroids almost. It involves like, they have like a, whole bunch of costumes to choose from. So it's like a photo booth, but instead of sitting in a booth, it's like an entire stand set up at a carnival. It's similar to pictures with a monument. Anyway, um, 
this is how photos always used to be. To get old time photos, you had to sit there and sit perfectly still for like 30 seconds. Um, even when like, you know, 25 years ago, you still had to deal with things like film and um, a, a uh, video camera was like this big and weighed a ton. Nowadays, you know, you just record something on your phone like that. Or yeah, you you professor, yeah, you needed someone else, uh, like a long time ago, a professional actually. Yeah, yeah, it, until very recently, you needed a professional to be able to film anything good. Like, has anyone watched old family um, recordings? Like, like back in the day, you needed a full-on professional like 50 years ago, then like the at-home camcorder came along. But has anyone ever watched those old home videos? They're like, unbelievably painful to watch um, because they were just so hard to operate. Nowadays, everyone has a camera. What has this changed? What are some of the ways in this in which privacy has been affected by this? Both for good or for bad? Um, professor, um, I was thinking about you can see things taking place like um, at that moment. You, yeah. like. Like just think about Twitter and how quickly information travels. If all information gets to you more or less instantly, the amount of people who have access to information about you is more or less instant. It used to take weeks for the news to get around the world. I mean, it, back in the day, it used to take months and months because you had to put a letter on a ship. Then they, uh, then they got um, telegraphs and that sped things up somewhat to about every few minutes. Nowadays, it's instantaneous, and it's not just like typed out letters, it's full on video. And that just means the amount of information that other people have access to is much higher, which also means things like anyone who wants to know what you look like can now know what you look like, like just like that. Many times I just, if there's somebody who doesn't have a, po a photo posted on their um, Zoom, and I'm curious what a person looks like, I will Google search your name, uh, John Jay College, and like that, I know what you look like. You okay. can do this. Yeah. I was going to say also, there were many filters before. You know, the only people that could put um, like a relevant or I guess uh, something that was shocking, it was like a news outlet, you know? Yes. And I think that's another big one is because cameras are so accessible, who has control over um, pictures has greatly reduced. So you no longer have control over the photos you take, and you also have much less control over who takes photos of you. So um, why is it that police brutality has become so much more discussed in the past 10 years? Part of it might be that police brutality has increased, but I think most people, uh, people of color have known that there have been uh, policing issues for a century at least in this country. What has fundamentally changed about uh, these sorts of situations? The access to the information, Professor. Yeah, the access to the information, and more importantly, what if you see somebody, uh, so the media has become more accessible, more importantly than the media, more importantly than anything else, if a cop, stops a person of color and is being extra loud in their vocalization about it, what is going to happen? It's easy to record. Almost always somebody nearby is gonna stop and pull out a phone. Somebody is gonna start recording what's happening nearby. So it's no longer the case that um, if you do something, nobody's gonna know about it. Nowadays, if you do anything, and especially if you're making a scene, odds are decently high that uh, phones are gonna come out and pictures are gonna be taken. I mean, every once in a while, I'll do something so ridiculous in class, students take photos. And it's like, this is something nobody would have had to worry about or think about. Nowadays, it's like totally the expected thing. And this ties in with CCTV. What is CCTV? Either the acronym or what does it do? Uh, the cameras that are recording? Yeah, yeah. Closed circuit television. It's basically just those cameras that are posted around everywhere and are constantly recording. And they're constantly recording in order to collect as much information as possible. And the argument is these are there to reduce, I mean, they reduce everyone's privacy, but the flip side is they increase security. 
The argument being that this is a flip side I didn't talk about. If people have information about you, then they want to get to you, you're less safe. But if a government organization or someone in power both actually has your best interests in mind and has access to information about everyone, the idea is the society as a whole is supposed to be safer. So for instance, if there's a camera nearby, you're less likely to break into a store. If there's a camera nearby, you're less likely to punch someone in the face. So this is a way in which just because there are cameras everywhere, you could basically, um, I mean, I'm sure some of you have seen the movies in which somebody hacks into the CCTV and you're able to track someone's movement through an entire city just by those sorts of camera uh, access. So that's another way CCTV and cameras have greatly reduced our informational privacy and greatly reduced our um, decisional privacy because either we can't make the decisions we want to because somebody's watching or the dis we have less control over which parts of ourselves get out there. If so everyone has a camera, you know, the police department has had a much harder time. The police departments worldwide have had a much harder time um, covering up uh, cases of brutality because they no longer have control over who knows what about the police because so many people are videotaping these things. So that's just a major change in privacy. Um, Jorge. You no, professor, I was just going to say the same thing that you were saying. In this case, I think that the more information that is out has kept, uh, um, has given people a little more security because those cases uh, that you were saying, like we know a lot more information now, but I think that those incidents have decreased substantially. Yeah, and I think one of the things that um, is really important to keep in mind is privacy and lack of privacy is, there's two sides to it where if people that you don't want to have privacy don't get privacy, it is harder to carry out negative or nefarious or bad activities. Like these days with cameras, it's much easier to catch somebody engaging in um, sexually inappropriate behavior. So did people see the photo that came out this week about uh, the photo of Governor Cuomo that came out this week? Did people see this? But yeah, yeah, that was, has been all over social media. Yeah, it was basically a picture of the governor has his hands around a uh, young woman, probably in her early 20s, hold, like that he didn't know, holding her face a bit too intimately. You know, 50 years ago, uh, there wouldn't have been any photographic proof of this. But now the governor is being able to be held to a higher standard because people have cameras. So that is, it's important to recognize that while privacy is decreasing, there are positives to it. There are, it's not only bad to lose your privacy. It's just, you have to keep in mind there are bads and goods going hand in hand and you need to be aware of the interactions between them. Um, so uh, that's CCTV, that's cameras, uh, social media. Now, GPS and smartphones. Smartphones are basically, uh, a combination of all of these things at once. But what are some of the ways in which smartphones decrease privacy um, other than GPS? Let's save GPS for a second. What are some of the ways in which smartphones are decreasing privacy in general? Professor, I, um, I was thinking like you, if people have access to you, like if you ha they have your number, they could just call you anytime. Absolutely. How many of you, um, Check your email, your work email or school email on the weekends. Yeah, I, I do, Professor. Yeah, everybody, like, and not only that, how often do you check your email? I check mine at least once an hour. What, what are everyone else's checks like? Uh, I, then, yeah. So if somebody wants to get a hold of me, just about every hour, they can get a hold of me by emailing or calling or texting. Compare that, like, think about how hard it is just to physically get away from someone. It used to be the case that weekend comes, you were free to go. The only way your boss could get in touch with you is call your house phone and hope you picked up. And if you didn't pick up, you just said, I'm out. I was out, boss. I'm sorry. You can't get a hold of me. It's the weekend. Um, I'm very sorry. Um, MD, did you have a question? I just saw your little blue hand there. 
yeah, I professor. Oh no, Jorge, yes. Also tying with the with the platforms, also like every platform has like a messaging kind of system. Yeah. So this you get bombarded with messages. Yeah, so even if you shut off your email, you can still get called, you can still get DM'd, you can still get Facebook message, you can still get what you'll get discorded, you can still get um your other five email accounts. Like every single way, you can no longer escape in the way you used to. So the smartphone, more so than just about anything else, has reduced our accessibility privacy. We now are accessible 24-7, 365 more or less, which just means that it is so difficult to just shut off our heads. There's been a lot of work on just like um, one of the reasons, how many people have heard of... Uh, I, the term first came into use, I know, in the context of millennials, but I've heard it many more. It, it applies to everyone alive today. Millen, millennial burnout. How many people have heard of this phrase? I'm not, there's no scientific evidence. What is millennial burnout? Anyone know? It's just this idea that millennials so people born between i don't know what is it 85 and like 95 just seem to constantly be exhausted and constantly be burned out and people from older uh generations don't fully understand like when i was that age i wasn't getting tired all the time and there's been some research that part of the reason that people these days feel so burned out is we never get to fully turn off and relax. Like even when you're relaxing on the couch now, 10% of your brain has to be monitoring whether you're getting an email. It used to be that relaxation was relaxation. Nowadays, you are constantly accessible. And because of this, our, our mental batteries are just not able to recharge. So this decrease in accessibility privacy has led to genuine, um, genuine psychological effects on human beings. And part of the reason why people are always so exhausted and so drained and so miserable is because we are constantly being accessed by others. And if we need alone time, it's impossible to get full on 100%, I need alone time, leave me alone time, correct? Yeah, Professor, I was going to say, like, we, it's like overstimulation, you know? If yeah, overstimulation is another matter, overstimulation. Another thing tied in with this with a smartphone is um, a, a way that a smartphone reduces your, your uh, decisional privacy is just the simple fact of the light that gets reflected off a smartphone screen. So um, most of the light that is emitted from the sun has a bit of a yellowish tinge to it. What is the color of light coming off a smartphone screen? It's usually like uh, white, right? Like it's It's got a slightly blue tinge to it. Um, so why does this matter? Well, because the human body evolved to deal with large amounts of yellow light. And we aren't really, like our, our body systems are not designed to process large amounts of blue light. So for one thing, because we're constantly accessible and constantly using, looking at computers, part of what happens is our eyes get exhausted and our systems don't work right. So if you, there's a lot of evidence that if you're staring at your phone right before bed, it is harder to fall asleep because your body doesn't process the blue light. So if you decide I'm gonna go to bed, it's 10 o'clock, but you've been sending emails because you've been working all day, you're not necessarily gonna be able to fall asleep right away. Your decision to fall asleep has been taken away from you by the very mechanical process of a phone. Another thing is phones are designed to be addictive. They are designed to take advantage of your primal instincts and your primal desires um, to get you to continue using your phone. So when you're like phone addiction, it's not just like a, ha ha, I'm addicted to my phone. The companies that design phone apps design them to be addictive. They design them to make it so that you find it harder to uh, get off. So even something as simple of, as how is Instagram organized? When you are on Instagram, imagine here's your phone screen. Describe what it looks like on the screen. How, what are you looking at? Do 
You're looking at pictures and how big is each picture? Like the size of the screen usually. Yeah, it's usually about this big. And why does this matter? Well, because what does this force you to do to look at the next picture? What do you have to do? Scroll, you have to scroll. Now, this might not seem like a big deal, but the whole point, like it is designed where the mystery of what's gonna come next, the next photo, the fact that you can't see that photo, the next one could be the greatest Instagram photo you've ever seen. And because you don't know for sure, your, Im your impulse is to scroll. If you could see 7,000 pictures at once, you could tell that the next one is not the greatest Instagram photo. The scrolling way though is designed such that it is go it's almost like a gamble. Like the next one's gonna be a great photo. So you flip. And if you flip and it's a nice photo that makes you happy, your brain gives you a little kick of dopamine, which feels nice. Like your neurotransmitters kick in and you are scrolling through. And now what you thought was like a, ah, yeah, you know what? Um, I have control. I can stop looking at my phone whenever I want. Well, the fact is that the more you do this, the better it feels and the more you're encouraged to scroll to the next photo and to the next photo and to the next photo. And because they come one at a time, they are designed to make it so that you stay on Instagram for as long as possible. Also, something along these same lines is um, that's something I want to say about Instagram. Oh, also, what is the number one thing you want? You post something new to Instagram. What do you want to, what do you want once you post it? Or at least if you're an influencer, what do you want? Likes. You want a like. This is, even the word itself is something with a positive connotation. Again, this is like, this is designed, the liking method of, of any sort of social media platform is designed to take, to kind of, um, What's the best way of putting this? Hijack your lower level desires and animal instincts to get you to keep going on the platform. So the reason why likes are in place are because you feel good when you get likes. And if you feel good when you get likes, you're gonna keep posting and you're gonna keep spending time on the app. You're gonna get followers and you're being told that the more followers you get, you might one day be able to make money off of this. So there's a sense in which the it's straight up gambling. Like it is the same thrill that you get when you're gambling. Um, yeah, you might one day become verified and you might get rich and you might be able to quit your day job. And so there's this very interesting thing of uh, one of the ways in which these smartphone apps and everything get you is they try to play up how much decisional privacy you'll get if you do this, but in so doing, they're actually taking away your decisional privacy. So what do I mean by this? They show you the person who's like, I created, um, I'm an in Instagram influencer. And now all I do is do what I love doing, which is putting on makeup once a day, making it look really good. And then I spend the rest of the day just cruising around on the internet. This could be you. You could have a job where you only work five hours a week putting on incredible makeup and networking, and you love doing this. Look, this could be you. You could have control over your life. But what's left in the background is the way, this very way of showing you, by showing you um, the Jenners with their new makeup line, they are trying to get you to care so much about the likes that you then spend more and more and more time on the phone app because the phone app is designed to be addictive and designed to make you spend more and more of your time on that phone. Um, any more on this particular aspect of apps and um, things like this? All right, let's talk about GPS. Why does GPS matter? First off, what do we mean by GPS? Uh, global positioning system. Yes, yeah, global positioning system, global positioning satellite. I don't know. I've heard them both. Either one works. Basically, what it means is there's a bunch of satellites uh, flying around in orbit. They look something like this. They're flying around. Your phone sends a little beep up to the, you live down here on Earth. Your phone sends a beep up to the satellite. 
The satellite sends a beep back, and based on where those beeps are coming from, it knows where you are at any given time. So why does this matter? What of the three types of privacy, informational, um, G informational, decisional, and accessibility, which one does GPS affect? Accessibility? Yeah, so one thing, it definitely accept, affects accessibility. Why? How does it affect accessibility? Because other people could potentially find you, yeah, yeah, where you are. Simple as that. If you know where somebody is, they can find you. If your boss knows where you are, they can reach you. If, you're, if your uh, mom wants to know where you are, she knows. So like... Um, Here's something I did not have to deal with as a teenager. Apps which track where I am. I did not have a smartphone as a teenager. Therefore, if I wanted to tell my mom I'm going to Georgia's house when really I'm going to the mall, then I didn't, that was that. She either believed me or she didn't. I'm sure some of you have the opposite problem, which is you can't do that because your mother is tracking you at all times. And that is a way, and why is she able to do that? Well, because this, these tracking location device apps are able to know where you are because of GPS. So your accessibility privacy is going way down. What about informational privacy? How is your informational privacy going down? Because somebody's tracking you and like, yes. um, like, would, do you really want somebody to be knowing where you are and like where, where you've been to? Like Google um, checks like where you are and then recommend stores to you? Yeah, so here for instance, is just like, what is your current location other than information about you? It is a type of information about you. But what's important about it is that information is intimately tied in to other information. So for instance, I'm gonna draw a map of New York on the board. It's not gonna be a pretty map, but it's, I'm gonna tell you right now, it's New York. Um, All right, so here's Manhattan, and I guess we can put Staten Island down here. All right, so here's what I'm gonna tell you. Here's just location data about a person. Imagine, um, okay, so it's COVID. It's COVID. Um, every single day, the only data you have about a person is the following. At 10 a.m. every day, they are, uh, they are right here. At 10 p.m. every day, they are right here. At 11 p.m. every day, they are right here. At 2 a.m. every day, they're right here. And you know COVID's going on. What do we know about this person now? We know nothing else about them except what? What do we know just based on this location data? We know where they are at all these different times, but what more does that tell us? What can we infer or what can we conclude from the fact that they are at this spot every single minute of every single day? Um, yeah, they either yeah. live there. They live there. We know where their house is. We know exactly what where they live. If we wanted to send them, like, you know, if we're a restaurant that wants to do home delivery, that's where we send it. More importantly, if you're a big company who does advertising, if you're Walmart and you buy this data from Facebook, now you know where to send them magazines, where to send things. All of that information is there. Here's another one. All right. You know that, uh, so I'm going to drop some, um, some more. All right. Here's, here's somebody. Based on their phone data, you see the following. Um, Every day at 8 a.m., they're here. Every day at 9 a.m., they're here. And then they stay here until 5 p.m., at which point they go, uh, they go here. And then, but they go here, say, 50% of the time. And 50% of the time, they go here. And then if they go here, they stay there. And if they go here at around 9 p.m., they go all the way back there. 
What do we know about this person now? What can we infer? What are some guesses we can make just from that, that data? First off, where do they probably live? This one was 9 p.m. to 5. Where do they live? In 9 p.m. to 5 p.m. Say that again, Andy. Uh, yeah, they're down there, the 9 p.m. to 5 p.m. Yeah, yeah, they, they live here. This is home. Now, what else do we know? Uh, he work here and he go to restaurant probably or bar over there on the A. They do something here every five days a week from nine to five. Well, we now know they work here. And not only that, they work somewhere down here. What sort of job might we guess they maybe have based on their hours? And Monday where the path they are? Official work Monday to Friday. Yeah, so they're working Monday to Friday. So we know they've got some sort of uh, date, like nine to five regular job. And based on which part of Manhattan this is, we can make some educated guesses about what they do for a living. So for instance, we know that they aren't, say, um, like a car mechanic, because there's not many car mechanics in downtown Manhattan. What are they more likely to be? Yeah, they might work on Wall Street. They might work at the DMV that's down there. You can begin to guess. Finally, um, if you know that, say, 50% of the time, so let's say, no, it's actually going to be something like 30% of the time from December to May, from 6 to 10, they're here. Or I guess it would be closer to like 6 to 9.30. Anyone have any guess what we could learn about this person based on these numbers? I'm curious if anyone's going to be able to hypothesize what I'm going with here. He hang up over there? Say that again? He hang up with the friend or in the restaurant? They hang out with their friends. And so, but what if I tell you something more? What if I tell you that it's not just that we know they're generally in this area, but if we zoom in, we find they're in a place that looks like this. And here's... Uh, 34th Street, here's 38th Street, and then um, I can never remember what the avenues are. I guess this is 8th and 9th, I think. Yeah, so they're going to Penn Station at that time, or what's above Penn Station? MSG. We now know, based on this data, that this person is very likely a sports fan because and not only that, they have season tickets to either the Rangers or the Knicks. And we know that because we know what MSG is. We know that they're moving. Also, if you have season tickets to either the Knicks or the Rangers, you're wealthy. You cannot afford season tickets unless you have money. Therefore, not only do we know that this person is a big sports fan, we also know that when they're in lower Manhattan, they probably do have a finance job because they have the money to be able to afford season tickets for the Knicks or the Rangers. And we know this simply by looking at their movement data and their times. Now, why does this matter? What can somebody do once they have this sort of data? If I know you're a sports fan, well, first off, who has this information about you? Who is it that actually has access to this movement data? I do not have access to it, but who does? GPS company. The GPS company and who very often, um, who very often is uh, the one who has control over that? Who is the, so the GPS company and who are they in business with? Or the who company, is right? Google? It's Google. If you've got Google Maps running, Google is the one collecting that information. And so what can they do? Henry says they can use it against you. But what exactly can they do with it? What That's sorts it. of things are they able to do now? Go ahead. What they do is they sell your information, right? So there's a few different things. One, they can sell this info. Who is going to want to buy this info? Advertisers. Advertising. And so this is going to tie in with the last thing I want to talk about briefly, cookies. What is a cookie and how does it work? And then I'm going to tie back in 
how all of these things together have just fundamentally changed the nature of privacy. So this one was starting to go with it in terms of the GPS and how much information you can get just by looking at location data. But combine that with cookies. Um, so yeah, a cookie is basically um, just basic data that's collected about somebody who visits a website. So cookies store website data and also who accesses the website. So what sort of information is usually contained in a cookie? Like when a cookie who's is collected, say that again, Andy. Who is the user and I said that. So it's usually going to be the IP number. If there's a username that you're logged into, that will be stored. But even if it's a public website that you don't have to log in, your IP number will be stored. What else is going to be in that? I think they also say password. So yeah, if it's a, if it's something that you need a password, it's going to save your password. So user pass if applicable. Now, very rarely will it save that. If, like a good website will not save that in hackable form. It'll um, use an algorithm, but some websites will make this available. But what are some other basic pieces of information other than your IP address? What you view. So what pages, and not only that, where you came from, where you navigated from. So if you click on a link from ESPN, if you're on ESPN.com and you see an advertisement for the new Nike Air Jordan, whatever number we're up to, the Air Jordan website will monitor that you came from the ESPN website. What else is going to be stored? depending on the, the thing. Sometimes it's location data. So where exactly that's tied in with IP address. Also, um, we're on, and not only that, where on the page you, like how long you stay on the page. So time on page and when you access that. So at first glance, this is all pretty basic information. All you get from a cookie is the IP address it comes from. Usually, and very, uh, let's talk about a public website so we don't have to worry about username or password. Let's just say like when you go to um, CNN.com, it's going to store your IP address, the pages you click on, where you navigated from, the lo maybe the location that you're searching from, that, that's more or less tied in with IP address, like a geolocation, sometimes there. But let's even throw that one out since we talked about GPS. So let's just say IP address, the time you spent on the page, where you navigated from, what pages you've gone to, and what time of the day you access it. Straightforward information. By itself, you might be like, who cares that a company has this information on me? But what can an advertiser do with this? What can an advertiser know about you just from this data? What are you interested? Yeah, interests. So your interests, why does that matter? Why do they care what your interests are? They can business with that interest. Yeah, basically, here's the thing. If you love fishing, are you, who's more likely to buy fishing gear? Someone who spends every weekend fishing or somebody who hasn't fished since they were five because they don't like touching worms. Who fishes more? And who's more likely to buy fishing gear? Who fishes every day? Yeah, the person who goes fishing every day. That's the person who's going to buy the stuff. Now, if you're an advertising company, what does this mean? Why does this matter to you? Well, advertising isn't cheap. Advertising campaigns take a lot of money. So... A successful advertising company is one that is able to do a lot with a little bit of money. And what's the best way to ensure that you do a lot with a little bit of money? Well, you only bother selling things to one particular group of people. So there's three types of people. Definitely buying. Definitely not buying, maybe buying. So of these three groups of people, who is the one you do not care about 
advertising to under any circumstance. And if you're spending money on this, you are wasting it and hurting yourself as an advertising company. Which group do you not care about? The definitely buys, the definitely not buys, or the maybe buying on the fence people? Definitely not buying. Yeah, you don't care about the definitely not. If nobody's buying your product, then you definitely don't want to advertise to them. Now, whether it's the definitely buys or the maybe buys is going to depend on the case. For instance, if something is always in supply, then you don't care about the definitely buying. So if it's something like somebody buys Charmin toilet paper and they have for the past 20 years, you don't need to advertise to that person. Why? Because even if they never see a Charmin ad again, they are going to keep on buying their Charmin. If, however, it's something that's rare or you need to let people know it's coming into existence. So for instance, a PS5, the people you want to advertise to when they're in low supply, you want to advertise to the definitely buying because they're the ones who are going to buy it, get it out there and start making things with it. Now, however, if it's something that's in high supply, you definitely want the maybe buyings. Why do you want to focus the maybe buyings? Well, you don't have to spend any money on the definitely buyings because they're already buying. You don't have to spend money, money on the not buying because they're definitely not. What you need to do is sway the people on the fence. You want to convince more people to become your customers. So the first step in any type of advertising is to identify the, these people. For most big companies that are selling things which are not sold out, so like a soap, a company that makes soap, a company that makes shoes, a company that makes clothing, you want to find out who are the people who are thinking about buying your product and not sure, and then spend all your advertising money there. Because if you have, say, $30 million and you spend $10 million in each category, then the only people you could sway, you're basically spending $10 million here. These people aren't changing. These people aren't changing. That's wasted money. If, however, you spend it here, these people might be swayed. So a better use of your money is to spend all 30 million right here on the maybe buying people. But to do that, you first have to figure out who the maybe buying people are. And the best way to do that is to gather information that will help you identify them. And some of the best information is cookies. Because cookies can tell you all sorts of things about people. So for instance, um, if you know what pages they're navigating from, what can you learn about a person? Well, for instance, if I tell you that uh, this, you are, um, you are Walmart, and you just got somebody who navigated to your web page from ESPN, what do you know about this person? Uh, he may be interested in something or looking for something. Yeah, but in particular, what sorts of things might they be looking for if they're coming from ESPN? They're a sports fan. And what if they're a sports fan are they likely to want to buy? Pittsburgh books. Yeah, they're going to want sports stuff. They're not going to just want, you know, you're probably, if you know they came from ESPN, now when they get to the Walmart homepage, you're not going to show them things for gardening. You're going to show them basketballs. You're going to show them baseballs. You're going to show them sports books. All of these are things you can now do as Walmart to advertise based on the fact that you know what website they're coming from. So if you only have $10 million to spend on sports advertising, you now spend it on this person because you know where they came from. And all of that is coming from cookies. Um, what are some other things you can know? So for instance, let's go to a classic case. And this is just to show how much more power these big uh, companies that are collecting your shopping data have in comparison to the, the, um, the past. So imagine the following. You decide to go grocery shopping, not online. You leave your phone behind, nothing. You just go grocery shopping. Somebody wants to know what you're buying. They want to know what you eat. So they decide to follow you and they walk you, watch you go through the entire grocery store, buy all your purchases, and then walk out. 
What do they now know about you? What information do they have? If somebody watches you buy all your groceries, what do they know about you for the week? Uh, what, what you're going to eat for the wait? They have a guess of what you're using for they They know what you're using for the week, but they could have a guess of what you eat. They have a good idea of what you're going to be eating this week. They also might have a decent idea of how much money you have or how much food you spend on this. Do they know what you thought about cooking but decided not to? Do they have any access to that information? No, probably not. About the only way they know is if you were deciding between two cereals and you picked one up and looked at it, picked up another one and looked at it and put it back. So even if you do a super creepy thing and follow somebody around in a grocery store, literally like hiding behind the, like the, the cabinets and everything else, you're not gonna get that information. If you go online shopping, is the website gonna have a decent idea of what you thought about buying, but decided not to? Yeah, how do they know? They do know, as Matthew says. How come they know what you thought about buying, but didn't? Yeah, either you saved it for later, or even, even if you didn't put in your shopping cart, even if you just went to that page, there's a pretty good chance. Like sometimes we misclick, but if you go on a website and you, like if you go and look at two different shoes, a shoe that looks like this and a shoe that looks like this, that's the ugliest high heel ever, but you get the idea. Um, and they know that this is the one you went with, but you spent five minutes clicking back and forth between these pages. They now know that even if you didn't buy this little boot, there's a chance that you might want that little boot in the future. And if they know that you thought about but didn't buy this little boot, what can they now do the next time you go to their website? What are they gonna do the next time you go to their website? Well, they show the recent. Yeah, they're gonna put this right there on the front page. They're gonna either give you a coupon for it or they're gonna be like, Hey, just in this new boot, which just so happens to be the little boot you looked at last time. And here's the thing about it. This is reducing. So by gathering this information about you, they are greatly reducing your decisional privacy. You, while on one hand, it's ultimately your decision whether to buy this thing or not, you are being put in a situation that makes it harder for you to avoid buying it. And how many of you have bought something on the internet which the moment it got to you, you were like, why the hell did I spend that money? I'm guilty of it. Who else? Anybody? I'm sure I'm not the only one. Sort of. Okay, we got a sort of. Yeah, we probably all have at least once. It's also just a test to make sure that somebody's alive on the other end of the line. Uh, so thank you, those of you who have responded. Uh, so yeah. Basically, we've all probably at least once bought something online we didn't need. And in part, it's because they were put in front of us. Now, what happens when you put all of this stuff together? And this is where the stuff gets really, really um, kind of, I, I'm not going to say scary, but really shows the degree to which this collection of privacy data and the way in which it can get combined together really has an impact on how we live our lives. So let's, um, actually, before I do this, let's talk about the technological changes that have allowed all of these differences, like the big picture fundamental differences in how technology has shifted that has allowed this in general. So one thing, storage. How has storage of information changed thanks to cyber technology? How are things stored these days? in the cloud. Yeah, they're in the cloud. So that means a few things. One, that information is accessible to anyone, anywhere, at any time who has a right to it. So the company who is 
owning the cloud and storing it and you or anybody else who has access to your account. So this means a few things. One, it means it's easier to get information into storage. So if, if more, if it's easier to get information into storage, what are the implications of that? What are some of the downstream effects? Think of it this way. If you, um, you're sharing a space, I guess, like with, uh, like with, um, it's like kind of like the park issue where like you're in the, you're technically you have privacy, like you have the right, but at the same time, it's like you don't, but, uh, the company usually tries to separate it. So not, nobody else can access the others, but it, it could happen. There's a few different things here. One is because all that information is in one place, being stored in one place. One thing it means is that the company themselves has a lot more information in their access. So Amazon has access to more information now than, you know, entire, like the entirety of like YouTube in a day probably produces as much information as like the first 20,000 years of human history, just because so much of it is being stored in one place. So they all have access to that. One thing that also means is this is tied in with the security thing of if all that information is stored in one place, that makes it a major target for any sort of hacking or access. Think of it this way. Um, why is it that Back when most money was stored in banks, people were always robbing banks. Why was a bank the place you wanted to rob? That's where all the money was stored. That's where all the money was. So in the same way, if you want to hack or you want to steal, you find somebody who's storing lots of information. And because things are in the cloud and therefore able to be stored in one place, there's a lot of places that are just asking to be hacked because of the nature of the storage. So that's the first thing. The information has a lot of people. So if you manage to hack in, you're getting a lot more. Now, also with the cloud, how easy is it to get things in and out of the cloud? Uh, from whose side? The, the user side. Oh, uh, it's pretty easy. Yeah. Think about how many of you, like most of the time your photos get posted to the cloud, you don't even realize it. It's so easy, it just happens automatically. Compare that with putting, like compare a photo now, like taking a photo and saving a photo now to 25 years ago. Um, so photo now, you, you capture it, you store it and you send it to the cloud. Back 25 years ago, what would you have to do? Did anyone have the pleasure of taking film to the store to get it uh, actually developed? Or even older times, you had your own um, dark room that you actually had to develop the photo in? Yeah, I did. Okay. So what, also the other thing is because of this, uh, so how many of you take a lot of photos on your phones? Anybody take a lot of photos? And I can ju just like selfies, snaps, anything. Just think about the number of photos you take. Now, would you be willing to take more or less photos if you actually had to pay for the film like the good old days? Like it used to be you pay five bucks and you get 36 pictures. And once you had those 36 pictures, you take it to, um, you take it to the film place and you'd have to wait a few weeks. So yeah. Because it's so easy to store pictures, we take more pictures. And because it's so easy to send them to the cloud and have them backed up, we're happy. Like it used to be, if you wanted a picture of your child, you took one picture of your child because film was expensive. Now you want pictures of your kids, you take 45 photos and you know what? Screw it, sort it out. A friend of mine one time calculated all the pictures that are stored in his cloud. If he wanted to spend like 10, like five seconds looking at each photo he's taken that's stored in the cloud, he'd be looking for the next 50 years at photos. That is all information being stored here. And so because of this, 
just we are because data storage is so cheap and easy we now are willing to produce a lot more and put it into storage which means there's more information out there about us because we're producing more information because of the technological changes so that's one major difference is the 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 uh the way in which things are stored, we can store it much faster and we produce more because it's so much easier to store it. What's another factor about the fact that it's so easy to store things? What is another consequence of this? How, when was the last time you went through your email and deleted emails? Anybody? How many of you are like me and have 10,000 unread emails? Anybody else? Yeah, I haven't deleted a lot in a while. Yeah, yeah a lot of us have thousands of unread emails. Why do we have thousands of unread emails? Well, let's compare that with actual snail mail. How many of you have thousands of, of uh, pieces of physical mail? How many of you have thousands of letters and thousands of uh, like little things stuff, stuffed in your mailbox? How many of you have all this stuff? Do you, so not in the inbox, I mean thousands of physical pieces of mail, like things that look like this and have those little stamp things and have addresses. How many of you have thousands of these just stored everywhere? Why not? Why do I have 10,000 emails, but I don't have 10,000 of these? It's difficult to handle. Yeah, because simply put, this takes up space and email doesn't. Now, because of that fact, we are much less likely to delete things. So the basic difference is with a physical piece of mail, the amount of effort it takes to keep it around is much higher than the amount of effort it takes to throw it out. With a, an email, it's the opposite. What you do is you, it's much easier to just leave the, the email in your inbox than it is to take the time to delete it. So because of this, things store up much, much, much more in digital space. And because of that, because storage is so easy and doesn't take up physical space, it means that things don't get deleted and information exists and continues for a very, very long time, which is why we have the problem of people being able to go on the internet, collect information about you from when you were 16 and use that information. So back in the day, if somebody wanted to find out things about you from 10 years ago, it would have been very difficult. And so tied in with this, if an advertiser wanted to find out things about you, they couldn't look at your internet history from 10 years ago. Now, because it's so easy for them to store that information, they can keep all your records ever and create a much more complete profile of you than they ever would have any other time or at any other time in history. So it used to be the case that like maybe a company that had physical records would keep hold of what you purchased the last, last three visits. Nowadays, Amazon stores every purchase you've ever made and everything you've ever thought about buying and every website you've come from and every time of day you've looked and every other possible bit of information about you and your profile. And because of this, they're just able to target you in ways like never before. So that's the first thing, just the storage of information has fundamentally shifted. It's now a lot more and it lasts a lot longer. The second thing is transfer of info. So what do I mean by the transfer of data? Well, literally just moving data from one place to another. So why, how has this changed? What major things have changed the nature of data transition and how has that affected privacy? So yeah, cloud storage again, because everything goes to one place, it's much easier then for large amounts of data to be transferred at once. So it used to be that um, another major difference, which I'll come back to in a second, I just wanna put it down so I don't forget. So one thing, because of cloud storage, everything can be moved in large chunks and a company can easily move things. The amount of data that's stored in like one gigabyte um, 
would have taken up an entire room's worth of file boxes if it's just like straight up um, like medical files. So nowadays, because it's stored simply, it can just be moved in large amounts. And because of this, there's no harm really in merging your data together into a single storage place. On top of this, it's now so much easier to copy and paste and exchange data. And so what this allows for is pl places that you used to keep your data in separate places. Nowadays, your data all gets mixed together. And the more data in one spot, the more conclusions you can draw about a person. So for instance, if I only know your address, I don't know much about you. If I only know um, your job, like if, or I only know your company, I don't know much about you. But if I know your company and your address, I can guess something else pretty quickly, which is how much money you make because where you live is going to depend, like how big the house is, is going to depend on what position you have at the company. So if I know you live in a penthouse, then I know that you're probably high up CEO, something like that. If you live in um, the projects, you're probably low down. And that's the sort of information you can get. So because data transfer is so easy, what you end up with is these merge Something I should have mentioned before, but I'll mention now. Privacy is relative. What do I mean by privacy is relative? Anyone know? What is it for something to be relative? It's like um, not, it, it's generalized. It's not really um, like specific to anything. It's like, oh, it affects it like indirectly, so, I guess. So that's related, but not, so relative has a bunch of different meanings. In this particular sense, um, what it means here is not so much that it's general, but rather that it's going to, whether something is true or false depends on a situation. So what I mean by that is right or left. Um, from where you're sitting right now, which marker is to the right? Green uh, the, the one in your left hand. Yeah, this one, green. From This is to the right. To me, though, the green is to the left. Why? Because left and right is relative to position. In the same way, privacy is relative to relationships. Or what I should say is what counts as normatively private counts as relative. So for instance, um, there are certain people that you're fine having certain information about you and other people that you don't want to have that information about you. So for instance, like you're fine if your doctor knows your medical history, but you don't necessarily want uh, an insurance company to know your medical history. Why? What can an insurance company do if they know your medical history? Oh, they can d either deny you benefits, like if it's too costly to, um, I think it was like, oh, uh, somebody had like a, uh, a disease or whatever and then like they couldn't they wanted to get have insurance cover it but uh, insurance won't cover it because the it's too expensive yeah, and it, they, and the risk cost uh cost benefit um the, their cost benefit wasn't and they decided it wasn't like worth it yeah so the way a health insurance company works is they're trying to make money and how do they make money do they make money off of healthy people or sick people sick Try again, Marcus. Are they healthy? They, they make money off of healthy people. Why do they make money off of healthy people? Well, if you have health insurance and you pay $50 a month and you never get sick, where does that $50 go? Oh, that just goes to them. It just goes to them into your pocket. So you're literally just handing them $50 a month. Now, if you get sick, they then have to take some of that money and spend it back on you. So an insurance company that, so for you to be a good investment, if you're perfectly healthy, if you pay $20 a month, that's $20 just going to the insurance company. If, however, you're sick and you're likely to need medical care, then for you to be a good bet or for you to be someone worth insuring for the company, you need to pay more money. 
if you if there's a better chance, like if you have a health problem and you have to go to the doctor every three months and insurance has to pay for that, then the, for it to be worth their while, you're going to have to pay more money. So while you want your doctor to know what your medical history is so they can give you good care, you don't want that information going to an insurance company who can then raise how much you have to pay a month. So, but because of the ease of information transfer, the likelihood that a company that you don't want getting that information does get it is much increased. Another one is like, um, think about how much harder it is now to get away with a crime by fleeing the state. Like back in the day, you hear about these old bank heists, like Bonnie and Clyde and these sorts of famous bank robbers. The way that they get away is they literally just get a, a car and drive across state lines. Why, if you commit a bank robbery in Texas, is getting to Oklahoma going to keep you safe? Why was it in the year 1910 if you committed a bunch of robberies in Texas, just going to Oklahoma, you don't have to worry about the oh, law anymore. Because they don't have that information because yeah. it's like all separated. Yeah, it was in physical files and no one in Oklahoma has those files. Nowadays, if you commit a crime in one state, it's immediately everywhere, sometimes even worldwide. So you can't even flee the country. So this is the sort of thing of the power of data transfer. In some ways, it's good, as we were saying before, because it does mean that law enforcement agencies can communicate. And if somebody commits a, a heinous crime in one place, they can be caught in another. But on the flip side, you as somebody in your everyday life sometimes face negative consequences from this transfer of data. If, for instance, um, your shopping history were to be transferred to your insurance company, what would be the potential problem there? What are some of the things you buy that you wouldn't want your insurance company knowing about? Uh, drugs. If you, yeah, if you buy, um, say, legal medical marijuana somewhere, you might not want your insurance company knowing that. If you, even something like you just buy um, a ton of candy, if you buy like a pound of gummy bears a week, you probably don't want your insurance company knowing that because they're going to consider you a risk for heart attack. So these are the sorts of things that become possible because data is so easily to, easy to transfer. And very often there are monetary benefits for companies to transfer this data. If I have a lot of medical data on you, um, so for instance, there have been cases in which insurance companies are selling large amounts of medical data to companies like Google who think that that, money, that data might be useful to them. Another thing is... Um, yeah, so just the, the ease with which data is transferred means that it can all be kept in one place. And because it's all stored in one place, that data is now much, much more useful for everybody. And it's gonna, the ways in which it's useful will become even clearer next time when we talk about data mining, um, which is like the real pinnacle of this stuff. So data transfer, data storage. And then the final thing is collection is totally different because of the changes in technology we've been talking about. So things like the camera, like the digital camera just means more data is collected. Think about like heart rate monitors. Heart rate monitors are a thing that are now, like that health data is now collectible and can be stored. Everything you say to your Siri is collectible and can be stored. So just the amount of data being collected and the excuse me, the ways in which it's collected are very new. And because of this, it's all being collected. It's just there's so, so, so much more information out there about you. So this is all the ways that it's changed and all the major complications and issues that come up with it. So um, let me just see where my notes are taking us. So um, what... What are people's thoughts on this? Are these things we need to worry about? Because there is a flip side of this. There are positives to the loss of privacy that we should discuss. So what are the positives that go in with this loss of privacy? Convenience. Convenience. There is something deeply, deeply convenient about having your website show you exactly what you want it to show you. Um, it's some, like, if you don't have to search through Google because 
uh, because your Amazon knows that you're probably out of tissues and it's time to show you tissues again. That's really super convenient. What are the other things? I've already talked about some of them. There are security benefits for law enforcement and other types of organizations that can communicate and share data in this way. Um, you also, in some ways, can, uh, because we can collect data and store it so easily, it's also possible to So for instance, uh, if a police officer is trying to uh, take advantage of their position, but somebody has a cell phone with them, it greatly reduces the ability of a person to exploit their position. Also, because everything is now recorded, it's very difficult for people in positions of power to not leave some sort of paper trail that people can collect and bring to the media, can bring to public attention. So that there are these benefits. But overall, and let me just open this up. What are people's thoughts on the overall privacy issues? Should we be more happy with the convenience that comes with it, the security and these sorts of checks? Or should we be worried about the ways in which this informational privacy loss affects our decisional privacy and affects the degree of accessibility in our lives? Are people more okay or more concerned? Usually people are okay because like the convenience just like and nobody really thinks about it. Like or like I guess people think about it, but at the same time, it, since the convenience is so high, they don't really care. Yeah, and so that's another thing is the convenience is so high, but personally, are you all mostly just like the convenience is good and I like having a social media, or are people worried about this sort of thing? Uh, they're not really worried. They trust the company with yeah. their um, to keep their private. But at the same time, there's been a recent like movement, I guess, in the past years, um, x amount of years, and um, now like people are kind of getting more concerned, like especially with because of Facebook. Yeah, and we're gonna talk and next Google. time about Facebook a little bit and just like the amounts of power that are there. But individually, those of you who are in the class right now looking at me, are you more worried or more just fine with these sorts of things? I think I'm okay. I'm like more or less like depending on like, of course the terms and what I think, but yeah, I'm more on the okay side. And just as a matter of fact, generally um, privacy has the importance and worries about privacy have gone down as like people who grow up with technology in their lives from the beginning the worries about these things are less acute, I think, to many people. Um, like there are many, pe like people in older generations are much more worried about it um, than, than people in younger generations. But there are cases which I think are like worth thinking about. And so I just wanna, we're probably not gonna use the whole time. We're probably gonna be finishing up here in about the next 10 minutes. But I just wanna finish off with one case that I think really shows what happens when all this stuff comes together and the way in which companies who have access to this much data can use it in ways that should make us all pause and wonder, um, why are we doing this? Like, is this really a world we want? Is this really something I'm comfortable with? So um, how many of you run, like our runners, like do that for exercise, anybody? On me. <laughs> okay. Okay. We've got we've got one. Okay. So running, running for exercise these days. Basically, there's only one piece of equipment you really need to go running. What is it? Well, legs. But in a Your city, shoes? like yeah, you need the shoes because in a city like this, you don't want to like cut up the bottom of your feet, and you need support. So running, the only thing you need is shoes. So. Basically, if you're a running company, there are other things you can sell to runners, but the number one thing you really need to try to get them to buy is shoes. You want them to buy new running sneakers, and there's a lot of different companies. So you want them to buy 
running sneakers from your, you, if you're Nike, you want them to buy from Nike. If you're Asics, you want them to buy from Asics. Now, how would you know uh, when best to sell someone's shoes? How do you know when to sell someone's shoes? Well, you don't, runners generally have a couple pairs of shoes, but once they have a couple pairs of shoes, you don't need, they don't need more. You don't, you only need two shoes because you only have two feet. Uh, well, most of us only have two feet. So therefore, if you're a shoe selling company, when do you want to try to sell someone a new pair of shoes? If you're a sneaker company, when are you looking to sell them a new pair of sneakers? Summertime? Probably why summertime, Howard? You're 100% right, but why is that a good time? Yeah, people like to go outside when it's nice. So therefore, you're going to aim for the summer. But say it's a really hardcore runner who runs all year round. When exactly is the moment that you're going to want to start selling them, trying to sell them new shoes? Springtime? The fall. So don't think of it in terms of like the time of year. Think of it in terms of them personally. What has to happen to them and their equipment before they're going to be willing to buy new shoes? They, so yeah, when they, the old shoes break or start to wear down. So what you want to do as a company is identify not just that that they buy your shoes. You want to identify when they're going to be buying shoes from you. And you want to know exactly uh, when to buy those shoes. So one thing you, that's useful on that is when have they bought shoes in the past and how far are they running? Because usually a pair of running shoes gets a few hundred miles in it before it has to be gotten rid of and you need a new pair. So you need to know when they bought their last pair and you need to know how far they run each day. Well, this data is becoming much more available to these sorts of companies. Why? What is the major technological advance that has changed uh, in the past 10 years that is now making people's exercise routines much more accessible to companies? Let's see if I can draw one. Anyone know what I'm drawing here? Fitbits. Yeah. What does a Fitbit do? You put it around your wrist and it measures everything you do. And it generally has an app that is in the background, which is collecting data. So it records your heart rate, it records your distance, it records where you go. So because of this, this information is now out there and anyone with your Fitbit data now has a pretty good idea of how far you run, what times of day you run, because generally people run at about the same time of day each day of the week, depending on their work schedule and other things. And so a company can figure out pretty well when a runner is going to need a new pair of shoes based on that Fitbit data. And companies like Fitbit are now selling that data to advertisers. So that your health data from Fitbit is now being sold. So that's one thing is now they know when your shoes are gonna run out. The positive there is the convenience, but here's where it gets a little weird. How many people know what happens um, or know what runner's high is? Have people heard of runner's high or experienced it? Anybody? Uh, no, but I guess it's basically like you don't feel like pain or like uh or like um tear like uh tiredness or like fogginess, and you just like you're just like so out of it, and you and you feel like you can do anything pretty much. Yeah. How many of you have exercised really hard, and then how did you feel after you finished exercising? Like you haven't exercised in a while, you finally do it. And you know you've been you've been locked in your apartment for four days, and you've now exercised. What do you feel? How do you feel about yourself? Depending on the person, they could feel great, or they can feel like crap because they're too weak. Yeah. So let's assume you worked out well, 
and you did a workout. It's the first time. It was a beautiful day. You're prob- you might feel bad if you push yourself too hard, but most people feel pretty good after they work out. And especially if it's a good, hard, satisfying workout, that feeling there at the end, that's runner's high. Your body releases endorphins after you run that put you in a good mood. Now, as a matter of fact, are you more likely to buy things when you're in a good mood or a bad mood? Good mood. Now, it's basically at either extreme. Either if you're in such a bad mood that you need to like um, retail therapy, that's one case. Or at the extreme of happiness and you're just like, nothing matters, I'm gonna buy something. But you don't basically want to buy anything when you're somewhere in the middle. So what you wanna do as an advertiser is find the happy people and the sad people. Well, um, yeah, some bin shop when they're mad. So it's, but basically if you're in the middle of your extremes, you're not gonna buy anything. So you wanna identify the happy people or the mad people, not the perfectly content people, like the perfectly like, oh, it's a B plus day. You want the A people or the F people. Now, if you have someone's Fitbit data, what you know then is when they run. And if you know when they run and how far they generally run, what else do you know? Well, you know when their run finishes. So if you know that this person finishes their runs, usually at 11 a.m. on Sundays. What do you know about them? Well, because of runner's high, you know at 11 a.m. on Sundays, they're probably pretty happy. And because they're pretty happy, they're gonna be more likely to purchase things. So what companies have begun doing is on, once they know somebody's a runner and they know their running schedule, they've started at sending advertisements based on what time of day a person does their run. So at 11.05, this person starts getting advertisements for sneakers. 11.05 on Sundays, that's when the ads come in. And this right here is a level of targetedness that is very different from anything anyone's ever experienced before as a species. And I don't know whether we should be worried about it or like Marcus said, it's very convenient. But the other thing to worry about is if you are being exploited in this way, are you really the one deciding to buy a new pair of shoes at this point? Or is the company taking advantage of your biological state to encourage you to buy something before you necessarily need it? Or to buy something that isn't actually the best for you because they know what mental state you're in at that time. Another thing is like um, things like Instagram, Things like uh, Facebook, when, sh- if you want to post a new uh, photo on Instagram and you want as many likes as possible, when should you post it? Anyone know? There's a set hour of the day that it's best. Uh, oh, that, I don't remember what the number was. I it's can't about, think of it. It's about, I think it's like seven about 7 to 8 p.m. in whatever area code you're interested in or whatever uh, whatever time zone you're interested in. Why? Because at 7 to 8, that's about the time that people have finished getting home from work, have eaten dinner, and are now sitting on their couch with their phones open. So if you post something at this hour, you're more likely to have it seen. Lunchtime is another good one, as Howard says. Times in which people aren't working. You don't want to advertise when no one's going to see it. You don't want to post something at 2 a.m. unless the people you're aiming for are like ravers or people who are up all night every day of the week. Or unless you're advertising for like construction workers working a night shift or doctors who work night shifts. And what you find is that on the one hand, it is more convenient, but on the other, your ability to decide when it is that you do your shopping and how much control someone has over your decision-making has greatly, greatly reduced as this information is coming out more and more and more. So this class was just about the way these technologies have led to more information and led to uh, a loss of privacy. And next week, what we're going to talk about is data mining for the first part of class, which is really the next step in it. And this is really where things get really weird. 
And so a, a case we're going to talk about next week. Um, has anyone either did the reading yet or heard of this case? Target knows teen is pregnant before other does. Has, have people heard of this news story? Target knows teen is pregnant before the father does. Either both her father and the father of the child. Have people heard of this? Anybody? Nope. Okay, so this is where it's gonna get weird. What we're gonna talk about a case in which actually um, the, so, like the big company Target is now able to identify when you're pregnant without you telling them based on other data they collect. And this is where the decisional privacy really goes out the window. Um, because when Target can know what you or what you need before you ever tell them what you need, that's where things can start to get a, a lot even messier in the uh, privacy world. All right, that's all I really wanted to say today. Does anyone have any more questions, comments, concerns, feelings? No. Okay, well, in that case, have a great weekend, everyone. I will talk to you next week. And um, yeah, enjoy. I think it's supposed to be sunny for a weekend for once. So enjoy the sun. All right, bye, everybody. All right, take care. Thank you, Professor.